different questions and I'm going to be asking you guys to answer in the chat and then we're going to go through uh, the rationales and we're going to integrate concepts um, covering, you know, your physiology, your anatomy, your pathology, histology, and we're also going to be integrating some other disciplines in here as well. So really, really want you guys to be active and engaged in this session. Um, comment. There's going to be lots of opportunities for you guys to test yourself um, and learn through this active recall style in the chat. So be sure to do that throughout the, the session. We will have opportunities for, for questions um, periodically throughout the session as well. Um, but yeah, super, super excited. Hope you guys are uh, ready for the next, I'd say, hour or so to dive into uh, some really, really high yield concepts covering neurology. Um, just to also give you guys um, a little intro, of course, um, many of you probably know who I am, um, but I'm also alongside Fahad and Khalid, uh, who are uh, leading our mentors and our groups here in our Discord community. Um, if you guys just want to give a quick shout. Hey, everyone. Good to meet you. I'm Fahad, fourth year uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Happy to have you all on. Good to meet you all as well. I'm a classmate of Fahad, also fourth year, University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also uh, soon to be a ophthalmology resident at the University of Miami. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so what I will do, we won't start just yet. I'll wait maybe one or two more minutes, but um, I did want to just mention to everyone that's joining that we will be giving away um, a bunch of my hard copies of my neurology guide. Um, of course, this session is inspired by a lot of the concepts in this guide, which is designed, of course, for your USMLE step one. Um, we will be giving away copies at the end, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Um, that's going to happen in our Discord community. Um, so in our Discord community, uh, we host lots of events like these. This is the first step one seminar that I'm personally running, um, but Fahad and Khaled have already run lots of webinars as it relates to the MCAT prep, as it relates to step one and step two, with everything from you know planning your study timelines and study schedules to uh, concepts similar to these style webinars. So be sure to go check out that community. This QR code is an exclusive 50% off uh, forever. Uh, for your Discord membership at $4.99 a month. Just wanted to put that there because we will be doing the giveaways and we have lots and lots of exciting things happening in our Discord, really at the cost of what a coffee costs you nowadays. So um, it's it's a really great opportunity for you guys to be in there. I will now, looking at the clock start, uh, I know probably a lot of you guys are eager to get into this. Um, as other people come in, uh, Fahad and Khaled, you could, you could just let them in and monitor the chat there. But again, guys, be very active. I want you guys to get the most out of this session as well. And the only way to do that is to also test yourself. So with that being said, there's a little bit of us um, in the intros, but we're going to be covering all of these high yield topics today. So we're going to start off with embryology and you can follow through. We're going to be talking about cranial nerves, stroke, spinal cord lesions, neurodegenerative disorders, a hemorrhage hematoma, brain tumors, demyelinating disorders, neurocutaneous, and then finishing off with some ophthalmology. So that's the roadmap today. Again, we're going to be integrating concepts from the guide and NBME style questions throughout. So stay active, stay engaged, and let's get on to it. Everyone's favorite, we're starting off with embryology, okay? And this is an NBME style question we have here. I'll just read it out. So we have an eight pound male newborn delivered at 34 weeks to a 24 year old G1P1 woman following a spontaneous vaginal delivery. The mother followed with her OBGYN physician consistently and received all routine prenatal labs, which were unremarkable, and vaccines. IPAR scores at one and five minutes are eight and nine, respectively. Physical examination of the skin shows mild skin dimpling, a tuft of hair over the gluteal region. Neurological exam of the patient is within normal limits. Which of the following embryological processes is the most likely underlying etiology of this patient's physical exam findings? Okay, you can see the answer choices there. I'll give you guys a minute in the chat to put your answer of what you guys think this is here, and then we're going to go over it. So everyone, to the chat. OK, we have some A's. We have some B. We got some more A's. All right. Now, for those of you saying A's, what is what diagnosis are you thinking this is here? A's, more A's. 
Spina bifida occulta. Okay, very good. So uh, for those of you who did say A, you are correct. And even if you didn't know that spina bifida occulta was specifically the incomplete fusion of the vertebral arches in the L-spine region, you could also do a little bit of process elimination here. Failure of neural crest cell migration. What pathologies are you thinking about here? You're thinking about Hirschsprung's disease, right? You're thinking about achalasia, right? Hirschsprung's disease, you're going to associate with what uh, conditions? Things like Down syndrome, right? It's your ag aganglionic segments of your Meisner and Auerbach's plexus, right? You get failure to pass meconium in the first 48 hours. Very buzzy, right? For complete failure of neural tube causing exposed neural tissue, reminder that our spina bifida, and we're going to go into this, can have a sequence of pathologies, right? Whether neural tube is exposed or neural tube is not exposed. In this vignette here, we see that the neurological exam is within normal limits, and the skin dimpling as well as tuft of hair over the gluteal region means it's closed, okay? So the no neural tissue is exposed, meaning that Correct. Spina bifida occulta is the best answer here, which is incomplete fusion of vertebral arches in the L-spine region. Failure of rostral neural neuralation. Reminder, everyone, rostral is your head, caudal is your tail. Rostral neuralation is going to relate to what? Anencephaly. An is without, and cephaly is your forebrain, without a forebrain, okay? So very good if you guys uh, said A there. We will now go into some topics um, as it relates to some embryology. So reminder. Week three, we have gastrulation, which forms three layers. Okay, that's a really way, easy way to remember it. You have your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and your endoderm. Okay, as it relates to uh, your nervous system and neuralation, we're really concerned with our ectoderm. Okay, and we have this we have this remnant called the notochord, which is actually going to induce the ectoderm to differentiate into our neural crest cells. Neural crest cells are really important because they go on to become the neural plate. And then what happens is your ectoderm is actually going to invaginate, as you see here, over the course of three days in neuralation to form our neural tube, which goes on to form our spinal cord and brain, right? And so we're left off with a neural tube, which is our spinal cord and brain, our neural crest cells, which we know have really key tie-ins, right? We talked about Hirschsprungs, we talked about achalasia, and then we also have our neuroectoderm, okay? So that's the process of neuralation. And we just went through some of these concepts here, but reminder, rostral neuropore and caudal neuropore. We talked about anencephaly and encephalos without a forebrain. If you don't have a forebrain, you can't swallow amniotic fluid, right? If you can't swallow the am amniotic fluid, there's going to be polyhydraminose, right, in the maternal fetal interface. Now, I did want to tie in another uh, kind of um, system here because I think it's really important. And another time you can get polyhydraminose is in esophageal or duodenal atresias. Really, really buzzy, guys. A failure to pass an NG tube is going to be pathognomonic for an esophageal atresia, okay? So if, if the NG tube is not passing into the stomach, you're thinking esophageal atresia uh, as well. Keep an eye out for signs of polyhydraminose, okay? And we can contrast that to something called oligohydraminose. Oligo is too little, right? And those are going to be things like renal dysgenesis. What can cause renal dysgenesis? We know uh, pharmacological agents like our ACE inhibitors, right? So keep an eye out for the difference between poly and oligo. And I am trying to make some integrations here. So hope you guys are following along uh, with that. We talked about our spectrum from occulta meningocele to myelomeningocele. We said that there were no neurological findings here, right? The, there was a sacral uh, tuft here, and that's why it was occulta. And very, very important, guys, our alpha fetoprotein levels are not going to be elevated in spina bifida occulta. So I could have given you the exact same stem that you just saw there, and it could have said, what would you expect in lab values? And you would want to choose that AFP would be normal, okay? Um, whereas in myelin and um, of course, since the neural tissue is exposed, you can't expect to see an increased AFP. And how do we prevent our caudal neural tube problems, guys? We need to administer folate in pregnancy, all right? So that's a tie-in there. And I just wanted to add my favorite mnemonic because um, it wouldn't be a med school bro webinar if I didn't do that. Um, and our neural crest cell derivatives, the step one exam loves you to know these. You unfortunately do kind of need to memorize these. I remember it with Motel Pass. That's a mnemonic I love. Um, we talked about some of these integrations already. And you can just think to yourself how the USMLE is going to test this, right? Laryngeal cartilage, parafollicular C cells, those, that secretes calcitonin. What is that related to? Medullary thyroid carcinoma. Or our Schwann cells. What do our Schwann cells do? They innervate our PNS. What system or pathology could you expect when it comes to the nervous system for that? 
you can think of guillain barre syndrome, right? You're ascending paralysis after a Campylobacter dejuni infection, right? So I'm just trying to show you guys how USMLE might test, you know, a neurocrest cell derivative um, type question, but relate it to certain pathologies, okay? All right. That being said, we are going to move on to cranial nerves. Um, and again, we have a USMLE NVME style vignette. So let's run through it. All right. So we have a 75 year old gentleman with uncontrolled diabetes who comes to the ophthalmologist's office due to acute onset double vision that began 12 hours ago. His medical history is significant for type 2 diabetes. His last A1C was 11%, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and social history notable for a two pack per day smoking history. On physical exam, his right eye demonstrates isolated abduction and depression with torsion, although his visual acuity is still 20 over 20. Which of the following deficits in the patient most likely to have as well? All right, guys, again, um, we are going to do this in an active recall manner. So you guys, I want you guys to put your answer in the chat um, before we move on and explain what's going on here. And if you guys have any um, just general content questions, we will be going through those. I will save those to the end. We do have a lot of content to cover and um, it, and I'll save more of the detailed explanations towards the end for you guys. All right, so what do you guys think here? Put your answers in the chat box, everyone. This is a little bit of a tricky one, and but we're gonna go through some high high yields with this. So, we have some D, A, D, D. Okay, really, really good. Um, so here we are thinking, yeah, D, really good, guys. So this that is correct, D. Now, this is a little bit of a complex question. Um, when you're thinking about our physical exam findings, right, we have the isolated down and out eye. That's very buzzy. What cranial nerve do you suspect is affected in a down and out pupil? Okay, what cranial nerve? Really good. Cranial nerve three, great, because you get unopposed action of your lateral rectus and your superior oblique, right? Cranial nerve three innervates all ocular muscles except lateral rectus six, obtusins. Prochlear is your superior oblique, okay? So you're gonna get unopposed action of your lateral rectus and superior oblique down and out. Super, super buzzy. You guys got it correct there. Now, there is another concept that you guys need to understand, and that is that your right upper eyelid is innervated by cranial nerve three as well through the muscle levator palpebrae superioris. Okay. And so that's another, that's another muscle that it does innervate. And so you could expect to find upper eyelid droop if your cranial nerve three motor is affected. Now, there's a really important integration here, guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of illustrate this in these concentric circles here. So imagine these are the nerve bundles of your cranial nerve three. Compression of the outer nerve fibers is actually going to be innervated by your parasympathetics. And a reminder, what do your parasympathetics do to the eye as it relates to cranial nerve three? Anyone in the chat box? What do your parasympathetics do? Exactly, constrict. Very, very, very good. So if we get constriction, so if, if, if we knock out the PNS, right? If, if something's compressing, because think about it, if it's the outside, the outside's gonna be affected first in some sort of compressive pathology, such as a, uh, posterior uh, aneurysm, right, of the cerebral artery. That's a very classy, buzzy association here. But what's going to happen is you're first going to get a blown out pupil because, again, right, if your PNS is causing constriction, if that's knocked out, you're going to get a blown out dilated pupil. Now, if that if that progression works its way inwards, that's where we can get our motor findings that we just talked about, our down and out eye, right, because you have unopposed action of your lateral rectus and your and your superior oblique. Okay, but I did want to mention that in this case, if we look back to the stem, though, quickly, this is actually a case of diabetic. Um, uh, look at the diabetes here, right? Really, really uh, high A1C, um, lots of risk factors, right? And so this is not an indication that this is some sort of um, uh, compressive etiology, right? So we're not thinking E. Because E is correct, of course, in something like a PCA aneurysm. But in this case, this is more of an ischemic neuropathy of the cranial nerve three. And so we're going to be expecting to find motor findings in, in uh, conjunction with our isolated abduction and depression. Okay. Now, I wanted to integrate and just show you a couple more diagrams as it relates to this here. I'm reminded that our PNS, 
our, our PNS fibers are actually going to synapse in the ciliary, ciliary ganglion. And of course, we talked about how they're going to uh, innervate um, the, the muscle fibers to cause what constriction of our pupil, which you guys uh, got great. All these other muscles here are innervated motor wise. We talked about all the ones. And then this is the key one for our question, levator palpiri, uh, palpebrae superioris. Okay, that was the upper eyelid droop integration there. This is just a, a little memory trick, LR6, SO4, R3. If you can just remember that, then you'll know exactly what I said, which was that your lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six, your superior oblique four, and the rest of the muscles are going to be your cranial nerve three, okay? And finally, in something like an uncle herniation, which we're gonna get into herniations, but that's when the uncus part of the temporal lobe actually herniates down the brainstem, that can compress structures, and one of which is the cranial nerve three. And again, what did we talk about in compressive pathologies? Our PNS is going to be affected first. So you're first going to get a blown out pupil. And then as it progresses to the motor findings, you can expect to see that down and out eye. Okay. All right. We are going to move on and talk about herniations. This is just a little bit of an integration. Okay. So if we think about herniations, what causes herniations? Increased intracranial pressure. Now, what can cause increased intracranial pressure? Things like a hematoma things like a brain-occupying mass or space-occupying lesion, like a brain tumor or brain mass or brain abscess, right? So what I want you guys to do here is I have the findings for each of these numbers. What do you think number one is? What type of herniation? Yes, a stroke can also, yes, a stroke and stroke and brain lesions can also cause increased ICP, correct? What um, is number one here, guys? What type of herniation is number one? Can you guys put that in the, in the chat box for me? Yes, there's a little bit of a hint here. You can see uh, uncle herniation, great. So tying back right into what we saw, guys, right in this region, we're going to have our, our PCA, which is our posterior cerebral artery, and our cranial nerve three. Those are the two buzzy USMLE step-tested concepts here. If we get an uncle herniation, look out for signs of our cranial nerve three palsies, right, as well as a PCA infarct, okay? That's really, really buzzy. What about number two here, guys? What is number two? Okay, what do I see here? Trans, yeah, okay, really good guys. So yeah, this is our central transtentorial, okay? Caudal displacement through our diencephalon, right? This is classic in our Duray hemorrhages, which are those small ruptures in the midbrain and paws. And look out guys for decorticate posturing, okay? Decorticate, just remember that all of the, the limbs are flexed to the core, okay? Look out for that. And finally, just for the purpose of time, we'll go through three here, which is your cingulate or subfalcine herniation. Classic, classic association here is your anterior cerebral artery, guys, runs right here. And so if you get this subfalcine cingulate herniation, you're going to compress your ACA. If you compress your ACA, you're going to look out for signs of contralateral hemiparesis and sensory loss of the lower limbs predominantly. We're going to get more into stroke localization, but really, really key to know that your subfalcine herniation, look out for signs of ACA pathology. Hey guys. Finally, a little bit of a physiology tie-in here, guys. Cushing's triad is really, really important. All triads on the US assembly are important, but Cushing's triad as it relates to the context of increased intracranial pressure, guys. Think about it. If you have increased intracranial pressure, you're going to have increased afferent firing of the baroreceptors. That's going to feedback, right, and negatively uh, send signals efferently, right, to decrease heart rate. So you get a reflex of bradycardia, right? Your hypertension, of course, is, is in, in line with your increased ICP, and you're also going to get periods of apnea and this respiratory depression, okay? Now, let's move on and do another cranial nerve integration with MBME style and vignette, okay? So a 32-year-old patient presents to the trauma bay in the emergency room after a severe motorcycle vehicle accident. He has no known medical history, but is found to have a sharp piece of glass protruding through the angle of the mandible on primary serving. He subsequently undergoes debridement in the operating room, and the neurologist that sees him months later in rehabilitation observes atrophy of the patient's tongue. The neurologist also notes that the tongue deviates towards the patient's left side. Which of the following cranial nerves are most likely injured in the patient's accident? Everyone, go to the chat box. I already see a lot of you putting that in. If you're putting F, you're absolutely correct. This is going to be your hypoglossal nerve, right? Now, what I did with this table here is I wanted to put the key notable findings that you'll likely see on the USMLE as it relates to each cranial nerve, okay? 
So what I, we're going to do is we're going to go one by one through this table, and I want you guys in the chat box uh, to put just a notable finding that you're expected to see. So in cranial nerve one, uh, get, what, what is some sort of finding that is, is very pathognomonic and buzzy for cranial nerve one if it's affected? Loss of smell, anosmia, very, very good. Great. And very, very important integration here, guys, is something called Kalman syndrome, right? Reminder, it's defective migration of your GNRNH migration to your olfactory bulbs, okay? This can also present because you have decreased GNRNH, you're going to have decreased FSH and LH release from the pituitary, and this is going to cause things like infertility and primary amenorrhea. So look out for those signs along with your anosmia, okay? Ocul uh, number three, we talked about this enough, down and out pupil, okay? What about cranial nerve four? Cranial nerve four findings, guys. Put it in the chat box. Yep, Diff oh, you guys got exactly it there. Head tilt away from lesion because your trochlear is going to innervate your superior oblique, which which does downward in, in portion of the eye. You're going to have trouble walking downstairs. Very, very buzzy if they give you a, a vignette with someone having difficulty looking down the stairs, okay? Your head tilt is going to be away from the lesion. What about cranial nerve five? What is it responsible for? Trigeminal nerve. Head button shirt's another good one. Yep, looking down. Face sensation, reduced mastication, love it. Yep, loss of sensation, yeah, really good. So guys, reminder that our trigeminal nerve, tri means three, it helps you uh, remember that there's three branches, right? We have our ophthalmic division, V1, that's gonna be part of our um, uh, sensation of our cornea, right, and, and the ophthalmic division. Then we have cranial uh, uh, V2, right, which is our maxillary branch. And then we have V3, um, which is our um, mandibular branch that is also responsible for the muscles of mastication and things like that. Really important, guys, to integrate the brain, uh, the brain foramina here. Okay. Reminder that V1, our ophthalmic division, is going to come through our superior orbital fissure. Our V2 is going to come through our foramen rotundum, and our V3 is going to come through our foramen ovale. Okay. Now there's another, there's another um, um, hole called the foramen spinosum and that what what comes through the foramen spinosum everyone maxillary it's a yeah and what branch of the maxillary there's a yep very very good middle meningeal artery through the foramen spinosum that's a branch of the maxillary which is a branch of the external carotid artery you can think of it as there's like a frost pneumonic right fissure ovale um, sorry, fissure, rotundum, ovale, spinosum in that order. So V1, V2, V3, and then your middle meningeal artery. All right. And just a, just a key integration guys with your cranial nerves, be able to identify the raw pot of a cranial nerve and, and the brainstem. Okay. Be able to identify, they could just point to a pot of a brainstem and you have to be able to identify the, the 12 cranial nerves. Okay. They might, they might give you that vignette of someone having difficulty walking downstairs and you, you know, Okay, it's trochlear, but they might just point an arrow to a cranial nerve, you know, brainstem pot and point to trochlear and you have to know what that is or where that is. Okay. All right. Abducens, we talked about the eyes already, right? Abducens is your lateral rectus. It's going to abduct the eye. If you have um, damage to that, you're going to get unopposed medial action. Makes sense. Facial nerve, facial weakness, taste to your anterior two thirds of your tongue. Really, really important, guys, that pace to your anterior two-thirds of your tongue is your facial nerve, but sensation to the anterior third of the tongue is going to be your trigeminal nerve, okay? Glossopharyngeal, part of your gag reflex, that's actually going to do both sensory and taste to the posterior third of the tongue. Vagus nerve, you're going to expect hoarseness, cough, uvula deviated away from the legion. Cranial nerve 11, torticollis, and cranial nerve 12, finally integrating back to the question that we had was tongue deviated towards the lesion. I love the mnemonic, lick your wounds. You've probably heard that one before. All of these findings you see here on the right-hand side of this column, guys, you need to know. They're, they're very, very buzzy, and they're telltale signs of certain cranial nerve pathologies. So make sure you have these down. 
make sure to think of what type of vignettes you can expect to see and make sure that you understand the brainstem uh, plot image, okay? Because they can just point to an arrow of the, of the brainstem and ask you which one is affected, all right? Okay, with that being said, let us move on to a big, big topic and that is stroke. We have another MBME style question here. So we have an 81 year old right-handed ex-professional boxer who presents to the clinic um, with his boxing coach. The boxing coach is worried that the patient's left strength arm, uh, sorry, left arm strength is diminished. While he boxes recreationally, his boxing coach noticed he is consistently able to dodge right-sided blows, but is rarely able to block hits on his left side. On physical exam, motor strength is five on five in the bilateral upper and lower extremities. When asked to draw a clock, the patient only numbers the clock from 12 to six. The physician suspects that the patient has a parenchymal pathology and orders an MRI. Which of the following vessels is likely responsible for the brain pathology the physician confirmed on the MRI? All right. Everyone put in the chat box what you guys think here. We will give this maybe 30 seconds for you guys to just read through that vignette yourself. And then we're going to dive into all about stroke localization. I see some D's, I see a C, D's, D's. Okay, if you said D, you are correct. That is your right middle cerebral artery. Now, we are going to talk about something that you've probably seen before, but you may not understand exactly what this is, but this is your motor homunculus, which is essentially this neurological map that shows the areas and proportions that the brain when we, when we developed, decided to uh, allocate to certain motor and sensory functions. And so this is where it's all derived that the ACA, you know, you're classically associating with greater lower limb weakness, right? Your MCA, your upper limbs, as well as your face and mouth. And then your PCA is gonna have the ocular manifestations. I just wanted to bring you guys back to this so that you understand why an ACA stroke might affect the lower limbs more than the upper limbs and an MCA, the upper limbs more than the lower limbs, for instance. And then here, the circle of Willis, this is just more fun way to draw it. Upside down V for vertebral, a big B for bacillar, two Ps for your posterior cerebral and posterior communicating. You draw an I for the internal carotid. You have little eyebrows for the middle cerebral coming off of them. And then you draw an A for your anterior uh, cerebral arteries. Just a little fun way that I like to do that. Now, we're going to be going through the stroke man, which is one of my favorite illustrations that has helped me score many points on the, the step one exam. And so your first, what you're going to do is you're going to draw um, P's for the eyes because a PCA stroke is associated with your contralateral homonymous hemianopia with your macular sparing because the macula is actually um, partly uh, supplied by the MCA, okay? But if you get a PCA localization of contralateral uh, homonymous hemianopia with the macular sparing, automatically think PCA stroke, okay? Then you're going to draw an M for the upper limb and the MR is, is there for the mouth, which is really easy, M mouth, because you're... MCA stroke is associated, as we talked about, with the contralateral weakness of your face and the upper limb, okay? Finally, A for the lower limbs, because your A is going to be your ACA stroke. We talked about contralateral lower limb predominant findings. Also look out for things like urinary incontinence. Now, where, where we're going to tie this back to our, our vignette that we just saw was with our middle cerebral artery. Now, it's really important to understand, guys, that our left brain, our dominant side, is going to be implicated with our speech deficits. Okay, so a left MCA stroke, you're going to look out for things like your Broca's aphasia, your Wernicke's aphasia. Remember, Broca's aphasia is broken articulation, where you still have understanding of speech, your comprehension is intact, but your ability to produce speech is affected. Whereas Wernicke's aphasia is, is I like to remember as a word salad, a bunch of blurting of words that doesn't make sense in any type of sequence, but the actual production of speech is not affected. Okay, so that's a, a good way to differentiate those. Now, what I have here is that a right-sided MCA stroke, because your right-sided brain is typically your non-dominant hemisphere, which is associated with your spatial, uh, spatial temporal uh, awareness, your sensory modality is right, that's going to cause something called hemi-neglect which is what we see with this boxer. The boxer could only draw half the clock. The, the boxer could only um, understand uh, how to dodge blows from one side. This is called hemi-neglect, where you have an ability to perceive essentially half of the world, okay? If, if they give you findings like this, think of the right MCA, 
that is your non-dominant or typically your non-dominant hemisphere. If they give you speech findings, such as in Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, right, you're more thinking a left MCA stroke. Okay, does that make sense, everyone? And again, come back to this. Come back to this simple, simple drawing. Um, it's really, really easy to to just get the PCA, MCA, and ACA strokes down pat with that. Okay. Now let's go into another question here. We have a 91-year-old woman with a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. They are on rivaroxaban for this. They're visiting her grandchildren and playing at a park when she had acute onset left leg weakness. She is brought into the emergency department three hours after symptom onset, and upon further history, she endorses not taking her anticoagulant for the past three days while on her trip. She is admitted, but despite appropriate therapy, she dies in the hospital with a ventricular arrhythmia 48 hours after presentation. She undergoes a brain biopsy after death. Which of the following histologic, histologic findings would you be expected on brain matter in the right middle cerebral artery distribution? All right, guys, this is tying in your post ischemic timeline here, but put your answers in the chat of what you guys think for this question. Um, C. I see a lot of C's. If you're saying C, you're absolutely correct. Neutrophilic infiltration with central necrosis. Now, guys, here is where we're going to be very particular with our timeline and duration in which we see these histological findings. And what we're going to do in the next slide is we're going to integrate this all. So I need you guys all in the chat box here because in 12 to 24 hours, what could you expect to see on histology post ischemic stroke? What's the key finding? that we expect to see 12 to 24 hours. I see red neurons. If you said your neurons, you're absolutely correct, which is our eosinophilic cytoplasmin, or you get this loss of nissle substance. So look out for these really pink red neurons, okay? As you can see circled here. 24 to 72 hours, what do you guys think? Appearances in the chat box? Yep. That's exactly what the question was on. This is when we start to see our neutrophils arrive at the site. Infiltration with central necrosis. Okay, three to seven days. What's going to be arriving at the scene three to seven days? We have our macrophages. Great. We're ready to phagocytose. Okay, look out for these looking cells. One to two weeks. Really good. Reactive gl gliosis, right? Mediated by what cells? Our astrocytes, right? What's a marker of our astrocytes? And that's going to be GFAP. Okay. You've probably heard it. Yep. Very good, GFAP. Very, very good, guys. And finally, greater than two weeks, what are we expected to see? Glial scarring. Absolutely correct. You're going to see fibrous infiltration with hypertrophy of the tissue there. Okay. Guys, knowing this timeline is super high yield. You're bound to get one question on this. If it's not this, you're going to get your post MI timeline. Reminder that your MI timeline is going to follow a similar timeline. However, in the first 24 hours of uh, MIs, you're going to get coagulative necrosis, right? This is when, you're, this is when your um, sarcolemma is actually prone to something called the reperfusion injury, right? Where oxygen, you get the reactive oxygen species, and it act can actually cause something called contraction band necrosis. Look out for that. You're going to get neutrophilic uh, arrival still one to three days post MI. You're going to get your macrophages, similar timeline, day three to 13. And then you're going to get your fibrous scar formation two weeks post. So guys, know this ischemic timeline and know your MI timelines and what they look like on histology. Super, super high yield. Just wanted to take a quick pause here. Um, and I was going to look in the chat there if there's any questions for me at this stage. But this is just a reminder, of course, that all of the sessions like this are going to be happening in our Discord moving forward. Um, and we're gonna only be hosting them in our Discord. So I'm gonna be running a step one uh, complete review series covering each of the disciplines. Um, so neurology, cardiology, gastroenterology, endocrinology, repro, hemonc, I'm gonna be going through them all. And all of them will be recorded and live in our Discord. This is an exclusive um, QR code to anyone who's loving this and wants to you know, have other events and attend other events that are similar to this. It's actually 50% off uh, for lifetime access to our Discord community at $4.99 a month. So the coffee to be in our Discord community. Um, 
Yeah, so these step one reviews are going to be happening every two to three weeks. Um, the next one is going to be covering um, endocrinology. Can I get a free neurology guide? We are going to be doing giveaways. So uh, as I said at the beginning, we will have uh, giveaways at the very, very end as well. But just wanted to throw this in there. Just going to have a quick sip of water before we continue. And yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this at the end if you guys are interested in joining our Discord community. But um, so, so much value in there. Webinars is just one thing we do. We host question of the days. We host office hours. We have uh, free PDFs in there for application prep, interviews, residency. Um, you know, a lot of people are just, um, you know, hanging out there. We have study rooms. Uh, we chat amongst our community. So it's, it's great. Awesome. Let's move on and keep learning. So stay active, stay engaged. We're moving on to spinal cord lesions. All right. 32-year-old male with no notable past medical history presents to the trauma bay after a crush injury. On physical exam, a palpable step off is appreciated at the T3 spinous process. The patient undergoes a thoracic MRI, which demonstrates acute damage isolated to the left side at the T3 spinal cord level. Which of the following clinical features would you not expect your patient to exhibit? Read this for yourself. This is a little bit of a tricky one, but we'll be going through it. Put your answers in the chat when you guys are ready. Rem remember, this is asking what would you not expect the patient to exhibit? And don't don't worry about getting it wrong. That's what we're here to do, guys. Um, I see some D's. I see some A's. I see some E's. Okay, so we got a bit of a mixed one here. So this is a this is a complicated one, but it's a good one because it integrates all of the physiology and pathology. And if you did say D, you are correct. It is right-sided loss of pain at and below the T3 level is not what you'd expect to find. You actually expect this to be one to two levels below the lesion. And you might've guessed what this pathology is. It's a neurology favorite. It's called Brown-Sicard syndrome. Now, why I chose Brown-Sicard syndrome for this webinar was because it integrates all of the, uh, of the pathways, your sensory spinal cord pathways. And essentially, what we got there was a complete hemisection of the left, right, at the T3 level of the left uh, spinal cord. Okay, so if, if you're imagining this is the sp spinal cord, imagine half of it is completely knocked out. Okay, now the key way to differentiate this is going to be through two of your spinal columns. Okay, we have our posterior dorsal column, which these mnemonics are honestly some of my favorite and ones that i used on my step exam um it, they're also uh, in my neurology guide but feeling very patient is the way that i like to remember our posterior dorsal column because it not only tells me that our dorsal column does our fine touch vibration and proprioception but the fearing feeling very patient tells me that this actually waits to decussate until the medulla so guys where these pathways decussate is going to be very important as to what we see here in our brown saccard syndrome okay we're going to just go through the spinal tracts and then we're going to come back to brown saccard but if you look at their spinal thalamic column right which is responsible for non-discriminative touch temperature and pain remember not that patient it's not very patient because it's actually going to decussate right away at the anterior commissure so very very simple guys feeling very patient and not that patient is going to help you remember not only the sensory modalities through each of the tracks but also where they cross now let's turn back our attention to this diagram here and let's just say for this purpose, that this is this is the left sided lesion that was affected here. So he got stabbed right here at the T3 level of the left spinal cord. Okay, and this is what we're seeing here. So the star represents where he was stabbed. Now, as we just talked about, guys, our posterior column is going to wait to decussate, right? Until the medulla. So if it waits to decussate until the medulla, our ascending fibers haven't crossed yet. So you're going to see. So all these fibers coming up. They, oh, and then they stop and they hit the lesion right there. And what happens? Well, you get uh, ipsilateral loss of your dorsal column tract. 
your corticospinal tract also waits to decussate the medulla. So that's that's but that's obviously descending because it's motor. But keep in mind that that's just an easy way. You know that it's waiting, so you're gonna get ipsilateral findings. Okay, it hasn't crossed over yet. You're gonna get same sided problems. If we contrast that to our spinal thalamic column, we said did cross right away. Okay, then you could expect that all these fibers are gonna be crossing over. Right, all these fibers are gonna be crossing over, and so you're actually only gonna get this this step off here, which is gonna be one to two lesions below. Because in particular, your spinal thalamic column is going to cross right away, but it does so one to two levels above the lesion. Okay, one to two, um, one to two levels, it's going to cross there. So just remember that that is that is the pathway that crosses. This one's the pathway that doesn't. Really, these two things will help you distinguish between um, brown saccard versus a, a different pathology that's going to affect your spinal tracts, and then. Like any type of mo uh, lower motor neuron injury, guys, because you're getting this complete hemi section, you're going to see ipsilateral sensation loss right at the level of the lesion, segmental fl uh, flaccid paralysis at the level of the lesion. You're going to get spastic paresis right due to a damage of your upper motor neurons. So, but when it comes to Brown Sicard in the in the vignette you just saw, knowing that the cortical spinal tract, okay. Is, is going to be this one here. Your spinal thalamic is going to be this one here and posterior column is going to be this one here. Just knowing how to differentiate them, where they decussate, what they innervate, that's going to allow you to answer all these questions. And then of course, there's so many different tie-ins, right? Think about B12 deficiency, right? That's going to affect your dorsal columns primarily. So you're going to see your fine touch vibration proprioceps can affect it, right? Um, again, I'll, 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 I'll put a little bit of a... Uh, deeper dive into Brown Sicard on my Discord after this, because I think it does uh, require a little bit more of an explanation and an in-depth analysis. But I hope you guys understand just the basics between our dorsal column, which is gonna wait to decussate, and our spinal thalamic column, which is gonna cross one to two levels above. And then you'd expect if it's, it's severed off, the lesion is going to cause one to two levels below um, contralaterally, okay? So that's the little integration there. And if you guys have any questions, we will answer those in the Discord after this, just because I have a bunch of content I need to get through here. So hemorrhage and hematoma, guys. A 74-year-old woman with uncontrolled hypertension and type 2 diabetes, A1C at 9.4%, presents to the ED with a fall and a three-day history of acute confusion. Her children report that she's been drinking four to five glasses of wine for the past four days since the death of her husband. Altered mental status workup is notable for a urinary tract infection, which is appropriately given antibiotics for and discharged. By taking antibiotics as prescribed, her children note that her condition improved for one to two days, but then she deteriorated over the next two weeks with greater confusion and left-sided weakness. Which of the following is the most likely etiology of this patient's clinical findings? So guys, take a minute to read that. Put your answer in the chat when you're ready. And we're going to go through this vignette. So I see D's, I see C's. Okay. So, so if you guys are saying, yeah, so I see some C's now, you are correct if you did say C. This is going to be your subdural hematoma. Now, this is a good opportunity for us to contrast our two main pathologies here that people, that students often get confused, and that's our subdural versus our epidural hematoma. Let's start off with the subdural. In the vignette you just saw, alcoholic, elderly, right? These are risk factors. These are buzzy for your subdural hematoma, which is more insidious in, in onset than something like an epidural, which can come after uh, trauma, okay? In your subdural, I like to remember subdural as S with a C. So I think about the Cs. So as you can see here, you have your concave crescent banana-shaped lesion. This is going to cross suture lines, and this is going to be common in chronic alcoholics. And what happens is, Without, with chronic alcohol consumption, with old age, you get brain atrophy. When you get brain atrophy, your brain is more prone to tear in these bridging veins. Okay, these bridging veins are delicate, become more delicate, and they can easily tear. Um, one other pathology, guys, that you guys can't miss if you see is something called shaken baby syndrome. If they give you a vignette um, with, with this CT and it's in a baby, and they also mention something about bilateral retinal hemorrhages, Look out for child abuse. Look out for shaken baby syndrome. That's another tie into our subdural here. That's caused uh, in a little bit of a different way because typically we associate our subdurals with our uh, elderly, our alcoholics, um, and our bridging veins. Now, 
as we said, we're going to contrast that with something called an epidural hematoma. Reminder, guys, that we have our carry-on, right, which is where the sutures of our brain all converge, okay? This is a very, very weak point of our brain. Typically in trauma, a blow to the side of the head can cause something called our epidural hematoma, which is not going to cause a convex lesion. It's going to cause, uh, sorry, it's going to cause a convex lesion, as you can see here, which is your lemon-shaped lesion, okay? And this one's often associated with your lucid interval. So look out for a period of, you know, 24 to 72 hours of a lucid interval. And this one's not going to cross suture lines. We already talked about the middle meningeal artery, how it comes from what? The maxillary artery, which comes from what? The external carotid artery, which goes through what foramen? The foramen spinosa, right? Guys, these are all integrations because they could, they could present, they could give you the CT scan, they could give you a vignette that shows an epidural, and then they could ask you what branch um, is affected or what artery is affected or what branch of the artery is affected. And they could go all the way back to knowing the external carotid, the branch of the maxillary, which is the branch of the middle meningeal artery. All right, guys, be sure to make all those connections here. Look out for the look out for the CTs. Um, these are very, very high yields to recognize. Okay. We have our next question. We have a 68-year-old male who walks who works as a car mechanic and has a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a 25-pack year smoking history, who presents to the emergency room with severe headache, nausea, vomiting, has started when he was working at his shop, has been worsening over the past two hours. His vitals are notable for heart rate of 112. Blood pressure of 194 over 98, O2 sets at 97, and respirate of 21. Non-contrast head CT shows a hyperdense hematoma in the basal ganglia that confirms the diagnosis. Which of the following is the most likely pathophysiology responsible for this patient's condition? Everyone in the chat, put your answers of what you think is going on here. Okay, I see a lot of E's. I see a lot of E's. So, I, I just want to bring you, your, your guys' attention to something. A hyperdense hematoma. That is rupture. That is that is that is an aneurysm that occurred. Okay, an E lacunar ischemic infarct. That's an ischemic pathophysiology, right? Is there any other answer? Okay, now I'm seeing D's. Uh, now I'm seeing B's. Very very good. Yeah yeah. So. This was a little bit of a tricky one, but I put this here purposely because I wanted to talk about charcoal boucharded microaneurysms and something called our intraparenchymal uh, hemorrhage. So, what we saw in this, what we saw in this vignette, if I just go back, is this really, really high risk factor for our charcoal bouchard microaneurysms, and that's that's our hypertension. And this is a very, very, this is very elevated, right? One ninety four over ninety eight is severe. If we look at our intraparenchymal um, um, hemorrhage here. With the hypodense legions, right, we're thinking, what was this? A rupture of the charcot bouchard microaneurysms, which most often occur in the deep brain structures, such as your basal ganglia, okay? I like to remember it because CH, chronic hypertension with CH, charcot bouchard microaneurysms, that's a great way to remember that. And then just keep in mind this key hist histological tie-in, guys, hyaline arteriosclerosis. This chronic hypertension is going to cause our hyalinization. This is also seen in diabetes mellitus. We can contrast that to our onion skinning, right? Our hyperplastic, right? That's in malignant hypertension uh, where you get that onion, skin, onion skilling concentric fibrosis, okay? Now, I wanted to, to make a tie into subarachnoid hemorrhage. And really the key differentiating factors here, guys, if it's sudden and onset, remember sudden with subarachnoid, you know, worst headache of my life, thunderclap headache, very buzzy um, risk factors. Think about um, uh, 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 adult polycystic kidney disease. Think of Marfan syndrome, your connective tissue disorders, right? Where you're going to get berry aneurysms, right? That can cause this sudden bleed and look out for this CT scan here. Look out for a sudden and severe headache. Very, very buzzy. And I wanted to integrate something here. At risk, so after a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you're at risk for vasospasms, okay? What is a drug we can give to combat this? Yes, yes. So nemotipine. Okay, so exactly. So our calcium channel blockers are going to be prescribed here um, that prevent um, vasospasm risk, okay? Now, I, wanna, I just want to uh, do an integration here. Our 
non-dihydropyrimidines, right, are the ones that work in our heart, our calcium channel blockers in the heart. Those are what? Diltiazam and verapamil, okay? Those are the ones that are cardioselective versus our calcium channel blockers, nitrogen, motivine, vasodilator, okay? Good. Neurodegenerative disorders, let's move on. 78-year-old male has a past medical history significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, alcohol use disorder. It has a significant family history for Alzheimer's disease. He presents to the neurology clinic at the ins uh, insistence of his children and wife. They have noticed that his memory has steadily declined over the past three years and on multiple occasions have noticed odd behaviors that are concerned about. Upon further questioning, they say he has been talking to an empty chair next to him as if he's talking to an old friend and that he acts out of his dreams in the middle of the night. On your physical exam, you notice that his gait is unsteady and he shuffles his feet while walking. Which of the following microscopic histologic findings would be primarily expected in this patient? Everyone, let's stay engaged. Let's stay active. Put your answers in the chat box of what you think is going on here. I see A's. I see B's. I see a mix of A's and B's. One of those is correct. So this one is going to be A. Now, B and C are, you're thinking probably Alzheimer's disease. A, we're thinking, well, I'm actually not gonna give that away, but we're gonna get into it. And D is also something. So I, I wanted to take this opportunity to go through the types of dementia, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a finding pop up here, and I want you to tell me what type of dementia you're expected to see. So intracellular Lewy bodies is what type of dementia, guys? Everyone? Yep, Lewy body dementia. Great. Very, very easy way to remember this. Remember hallucinations, okay? You're going to get classic visual hallucinations with your onset of Parkinsonian motor symptoms, right? Less than a year apart. Now, if we go back to this vignette here, you know, in the, the US and will often do this. They'll give you family history of Alzheimer's. They'll try to hint at Alzheimer's. They'll give you two answer choices that pertain to Alzheimer's. But guys, you know, these visual hallucinations, these Parkinsonian features that we're seeing here is more in line with Lewy body dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Finding multiple cortical infarcts, subcortical infarcts. What type of dementia is that? Good, vascular. This stem is going to give you guys a progression, a deterioration, right, over many years. And they're going to give you tons of risk factors for strokes, right, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, diabetes, et cetera. So if you look out for a history of that, look out for that in the vignette and look for this stepwise decline in cognitive ability over years. And that's going to show that there's been multiple infarcts that have been occurring over the years. Okay, look out for that. Now, hyperphosphorylated tau, pick bodies. What type of dementia is that? Frontotemporal, Neiman pick, exactly. So frontotemporal, um, aka Pick's disease. This is where you're gonna look out for a stem. Cognition, impulsive, um, hyper aroused, hyper aggressive, hypersexual. Look for frontotemporal dementia. Look for atrophy of the frontal and temporal brain. And then on histology, again, our hyperphosphorylated tau, our PIC bodies. Finally, our last one, prion sheets, spongiform cortex. Yeah, very good. CJD, Kretzfeld Jakob disease. I hope that's how you pronounce that. But this one, you're going to look out for rapid onset of dementia. You can also get the myoclonus, right? But if it, if it gives you a vignette with rapid onset dementia, and they do mention signs of myoclonus, you're automatically gonna think of uh, CJD, think of prion sheets, think of elevated 433 protein in the CSF, that's our integration right there. And I just wanted to add this histology slide because it's very, very high yield. Obviously you can see this in Lewy body dimension, you can see this in Parkinson, is your alpha synuclein, it's your intracellular eosinophilic inclusion. And they can even, the USMLE can go so far to give you this vignette, right? Give you the vignette you just saw. And they could say, they could give you intracellular eosinophilic inclusion. 
and they can give you a list of other things and you'd have to know that a Louis body is your intracellular ESR included, okay? I just wanted to show that image there because it's super, super high yield. Now, I wanted to take this time. Um, again, all of these illustrations, all of the concepts that you see here, the memory tricks, this is all from my neurology guide. Um, but I did want to take an opportunity to just go through three of the dopamine pathways. So our mesolimbic pathway is the pathway that's responsible for our positive symptoms in psychosis. Okay, so our hallucinations, our delusions. Okay, and we classically give anti uh, antipsychotics, D2, remember those are D2 antagonists, right, to combat this. We want to decrease dopamine from the ventral tegmentum that projects to the nucleus um, cummins, right? And that's going to actually decrease our positive symptoms, decrease hallucinations, and, and help stabilize um, a psychosis. However, guys, this is where the integration is key. If we give antipsychotics that affect our, that block our D2 receptors, right? This is going to decrease dopamine in our other pathways. And our other dopamine pathways are really important for things like movement. If we think about our nigrostriatal pathway, right? Next, our striatum to our nigro, uh, substantia nigra, right? It's right in the name. This is responsible and this is highly buzzy for our Parkinson's disease and our extra pyramidal symptoms. So think about it. We're giving antipsychotics. They help our psychosis. They treat our mesolimbic pathway, right? But now we're decreasing dopamine availability in our nigrostriatal pathway, and this can cause our Parkinsonianism features. What are our Parkinsonian uh, features, guys? Remember the traps mnemonic: tremor, rigidity, akinesia, postural instability, shuffling gait, right? Finally, our tubular infundibular pathway. Just remember this relationship: super high yield, dopamine, and prolactin are inversely correlated and related, okay? Which means if you have an increase in dopamine, you get a decrease in prolactin. If you have an increase in prolactin, you get a decrease in dopamine. If we give antipsychotics again, classic example, they block D2 receptors, decrease dopamine. Decreased dopamine means increased prolactin. Increased prolactin, now we can you think of the pathologies that would, would be related, right? Galactorrhea, amenorrhea, right? That's very, very key, guys, to understand these different pathways and the integration with antipsychotics, okay? And Parkinson's, brain, brain tumors. Let's do this. And we are, guys, getting towards the end here. Uh, stay active, stay engaged. We are probably in the final three questions, three, four questions here. Okay. A 68-year-old male was recently diagnosed with a brain tumor after presented to the emergency room with headaches, nausea, vomiting, and seizures. MRI imaging demonstrates an irregularly shaped heterogeneous mass predominantly in the right cerebral hemisphere, but crossing over the corpus callosum. He recently underwent biopsy with neurosurgery with a sample undergoing pathological analysis. Which of the following histologic findings would be expected from this patient's bi brain biopsy? You guys are very quick to this one. Very, very good if you're thinking a glioblastoma, multiforme, glial cells, GFAT positive. Very, very good. We will go through all these other ones here, guys. So as, a, as an active recall manner, what, what do you guys think? Somomal bodies, what brain tumor is classic for somomal bodies? Put it in the chat. The MoMA bodies. The MoMA bodies, meningiomas, guys. The MoMA bodies, think of meningiomas. Swan cells, S100. What, uh, what are you thinking there? What brain tumor are you thinking there? Swanoma, great. Bilateral, NF2, neurofibromatosis 2. It's a mouthful. We talked about glial cells GFAP positive, right? We talked about GFAP as a marker of what? Astrocytes, okay? Large vacuolated cells with round root nuclei. This is your oligodendrocytes. I remember oleg odendrocytes, egg, right? Fried egg appearance, right? Chicken wire capillaries. And finally, densely packed thin wall capillaries. What is that? Mangioblastoma, very, very good. Let's take it one step further, everyone. What neurocutaneous syndrome classically has a hemangioblastoma? Holly, you are on it. VHL is very, very correct. Von Hippo-Lindau disease, remember HARP pneumonic, hemangioblastoma, angiomatosis, renal cell carcinoma, and pheochromocytoma. Guys, the neurocutaneous we're gonna go into, but it's very, very key that you, you pick out um, these certain syndromic features, okay? Let's go through brain tumors. So a really, really easy way, guys, to differentiate our adult versus pediatric brain tumors is going to be based on our landmark of the tentorium. Adults are older. You can think they're super. They are supratentorial, okay? And when it relates to glioblastoma multiforme, we were thinking of that, what, 
across the corpus callosum. It was GFAT positive. These are all indicators. This is a high yield CT image. Or this is a high yield coronal section here. And I like to remember the mnemonic glioplastoma multiform because that helps me remember pseudo palisading, right? Is what you can see on histology. Crosses midline on an SG fat positive. Now, we're going to go into a question that relates to pediatric and we're going to go over our pediatric histology after this. A four year old boy presents the pediatrician with an unsteady gait and inability to maintain trunkal stability. Pediatrician is concerned for neurologic etiology and orders a brain MRI. Upon further workup, anaplastic small round blue cells are found on biopsy of a neuroectodermal derived tumor. Which of the following brain tumors does this patient have? Everyone in the chat box. I see ease. I see ease. Very, very good job if you're saying E. Medulloblastoma is correct here. Let's just do a quick rapid fire. Cranial pharyngioma is going to be what? Derived from your Rathsky pouch. For your Rathsky pouch is a um, derivative of your adenohypothesis, right? Your anterior pituitary, your oral ectoderm. These are all associations to remember, guys. Think of a calcified cyst. Think hypopituitarism because this is the one that compresses your pituitary and you're going to think of that uh, calcified cyst on imaging. Penealoma is going to classically cause something called Paranoid syndrome. This is because your pineal gland, reminder, is, is towards the posterior of the brain. And a pineoloma is going to be in relation to something called the tectum. Okay. And the tectum is going to be responsible for your vertical gaze coordination. If it compresses this, you're going to get a vertical gaze palsy. And that's very, very buzzy and classic for pineoloma. Okay. Vertical gaze. Yep. Really good, Holly. Polycystic astrocytoma, ependymoma. We're going to talk about in the next slides. Um, Pilocystic astrocytoma, I think pilocystic with posterior ependymoma is your in your fourth ventricle. And we talked about our medulloblastoma classically found in the cerebral, uh, cerebral ver vermis, which is why we got this truncal instability. Okay. This is very high yield, guys. Um, and histology in particular is something you will 100% see on your step exam. So, pediatric tumors. What did we say about adults? We said they're adults or older. We said they're superintentorial. So, then what is children? Children are younger, they're infantentorial. Okay. Now I have histology slides here and I want you guys to tell me what you see and what is the brain tumor. Okay. This first one, what are you guys thinking? What is that? In the chat box, in the chat box, everyone. If you're saying medulloblastoma, you're absolutely correct. And if you're saying homeroid rosette, Kathleen, exactly. This is your homeroid rosette. This is going to be common in their cerebellum, which is why we saw the truncal findings, right? The, the instability. It's a very common pediatric tumor. I like to remember blast the Homer run, medulloblastoma, blast the Homer run. You get these Homer right rosettes. Okay, next one. What is this, guys? Put your answers in the chat box. There's no wrong answers right now. Pilocystic. Yep. If you're saying pilocystic, you are absolutely correct. These are going to be your Rosenthal fibers, guys. This is also going to be part of that lineage of your GFAT positive. I remember the P's of pilocystic, right? It's a pediatric brain tumor, posterior fossa, GFAP positive, right? This one's going to be low grade. It actually has a typically a pretty good prognosis. Okay, guys, your most common brain tumor. Last one. What is this, guys? Yep, epidymoma, and these are your perivascular pseudo rosettes. Get your mom roses for her birthday, guys. Um, is the mnemonic? I never forgot it after I learned that one because uh, you get these rosettes, epidymoma, right? And it's associated with NF two. Remember, guys, these ones are part of your what? Fourth ventricle typically are found in your fourth ventricle. Okay, so cerebellar, posterior fossa, fourth ventricle. Know the histology, know the vignettes, know the infratentorial, supratentorial associations. Okay, guys, let's move on. Demyeling disorders, we are almost at the end, guys. Keep active, keep engaged. 27-year-old woman, 
who works as a lawyer in Maine, presents to her family physician's office because of a difficulty with her vision over the past week. She reports a painful unilateral vision loss. Her temperature is 91.1, heart rate 89, um, and O2 stats are 98%. On physical exam, she has uh, trace vision in her right eye, and you also note a lateral gaze nystagmus of the left eye when adducting the right. She notes having similar findings eight months ago that resolved with rest. Upon further questioning, she reveals that she's been using significant amounts of cocaine to stay awake and energized at work. She is also sexually active with three male partners with whom she does not use condoms. In her free time, she likes to hike in wooded areas in Maine's nature preserves. Which of the following diagnostic findings would be expected and that predominantly are responsible for her clinical findings in this patient? All right, guys, take a second to go through that and put your answers in the chat box. I see C's, I see D's, I see E's, I see a mix. So the correct answer here, guys, is C. And what diagnosis do you suspect that this is? For those who said C, multiple sclerosis. Great, Kathleen. Great, Benny. Great. Yep, all you guys are getting that. Amazing. Guys, with multiple sclerosis, anytime on the USMLE you are presented with a young female with focal neurological deficits, automatically you are thinking multiple sclerosis. Okay, guys, I threw in Maine to think of Lyme disease. That has no correlation to what we're talking about here. You know, we threw in uh, some other things like the cocaine to stay energized at work. Um, but those are not related to what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is what? What pathology, guys, is your lateral gaze nystagmus of the left eye when adducting the right eye? What What is that called? Marcus and pupil is, is, is optic neuritis. Yep. MLF pathway. Yep. Holly, very, very good. Now, if you get disruption of your MLF pathway, what is that called that we saw here? We're almost there. MLF pathway is the one affected. Does anyone know? Yep. Intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Very, very good, Holly. So we are going to talk about this in the next slide here, which is all about multiple sclerosis. And what we saw here, what we saw in that vignette was this INO. So guys, let's just take a step back here. M multiple sclerosis is demyelination of your central nervous system. Your central nervous system is, is is myelinated by your oligodendrocytes, okay? Now, why why do we get this INO? Well, we have something called our medial, medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is our MLF pathway. This is actually myelinated, guys, by our CNS. And so this is why in MS you get INO, because the MLF pathway coordinates cranial nerve 3 with cranial nerve 6. If we go back to our cranial nerves and talking about the ocular movements, right? Cranial nerve six is going to abduct, cranial nerve three is going to adduct, right? Our MLF pathway connects these two, and it allows us to coordinate our horizontal gaze, our lateral gaze, okay? Now, if you get disruption of this MLF pathway, because why? Multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disorder of the CNS. Your MLF pathway is, is uh, myelinated by oligodendrocytes, which are what? Myelinate the CNS, right? We're integrating all of that. You're going to get this ipsilateral nystagmus, and difficulty with abducting the affected eye. Okay, so guys, staying out for INO. Young females, focal neurologic deficits. Think MS. If we relate it back to the question, guys, in our CSF, we're going to get illegal clonal glands of IgG. Reminder that uh, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune pathophysiology, guys. IgG or immunoglobulins are going to be increased in our CSF. Okay, that's the integration there. If we think about Schwann cells, which innervate our PNS right? That's, you're going to be thinking your Gullian barre syndrome. Okay, guys, those are the really, really two key integrations there. Now, if we quickly go through the other ones, um, positive RPR and FTA ABS testing, this is syphilis, guys. When you're thinking about syphilis, reminder that we have our primary, secondary, latent, and tertiary phases. Syphilis, painless chancre is going to be the first lesion that you see in a primary. And then the other thing that they like testing, guys, is your tertiary syphilis. And I want to bring back a neuro high-end, and that's Pabes dorsalis. And your tertiary, tertiary syphilis, guys, you can get something called Pabes dorsalis, which knocks out your dorsal columns. Let's go back and remind ourselves that what did our dorsal columns do? They were feeling very patient, right? Fine touch, vibration, proprioception, and they waited to decussate at the medulla, okay? Very, very key tie-ins. What other pathologies can affect our dorsal columns? We think B12 deficiency. When you're thinking B12 deficiency, you can think of Crohn's, you can think of diphyllatum, um, the, the, that worm that affects B12 absorption, right? These are all key tie-ins. B12 absorption, let's go one step further. You can get what? You can get a macrocytic anemia, greater than, your MCV greater than 100. 
right? These are all key tie-ins, guys. I hope you guys are liking this integration. Um, positive serum studies for anti-nuclear antibody and DS, uh, double-stranded DNA antibody. That is going to be uh, past mnemonic for your SLE. SLE, guys, remember, malar rash. Uh, really, there's tons of systemic manifestations that you uh, that are presented, right? Arthralgias, fatigue, all of that. And then positive Lyme IgM and IgG titers, that is your Lyme disease. What what bug? Borrelia burgdorferi, guys. You're going to get exactly Borrelia. You're going to get that bullseye rash, your erythema migrans. And remember, guys, this can classically cause, in the late stages, third-degree heart block, okay? There we go. MS, that's the that's the pathway there. And remember these periventricular plaques on MRI, very, very buzzy and high yield too. Okay, guys? Almost to the end, I promise two questions left. An 11-year-old male child immigrates from his family to the United States from a developing country where he has not received any medical care to date. He presents to the pediatrician with his mom who believes he's had worsening skin lesions around the nose and cheeks that resemble acne-like lesions. Upon further history, the mother endorses a distant history of bad snarls and spasms a few years after birth. On exam, the child has hypopigmented maculas on the trunk extremities and small tumors distributed across the nasal bridge and face. Which of the following findings is associated with the patient's condition? What do you guys think here? I see C's, I see a B. I see C and I see one step further. Ayush, very, very good. Yes, if you're saying C and you're thinking tuberous sclerosis, you are absolutely correct. Reminder, guys, tuberous sclerosis, you're going to have that intellectual disability, infantile spasms, you're going to have the face angio uh, fibromas, the Ashley spots, guys, Ashley spots, hypopigmented uh, macules, guys, what are those referring to? What are the hypopigmented macules referring to, guys? What are those called? Ashley spots, very, very good. And we, yep, we have Ashley spots. Exactly. Very, very good. So tuberous sclerosis, um, a really, really key one for this and why I put it on that on that vignette is because tuberous sclerosis is the only neurocutaneous disorder that can cause that cardiac uh, rhabdomyoma as well as a renal angiomyolipoma. So they often test these ones. They often like testing exceptions and like tuberous sclerosis is one that has the rhabdomyoma and renal angiolipoma. So those are two ones you want to really, really recognize um, for your USMLE. Okay. You can remember harmatoma um as the mnemonic here we talked about all these findings that you can expect to see um in tuberous sclerosis now let's just do a quick rapid review of some of the other neocutaneous we have our sturge weber syndrome right you can remember a sturge web classic that port wine stain you see a port wine stain on the child or you see these tram track sign on ct with you know raised icp epilepsy intellectual disability um you're going to often think of sturge weber and finally we're going to get to neurofibroma uh, tosis, which is super, super high yield. Reminder that we have type one and type two. Neurofibromatosis is 17 letters. If I can help you remember, NF1 is on chromosome 17. And there you go. Half ALA spot is super buzzy and super um, important to recognize. Contrast the score Ashley spot, which is hypopigmented, or half ALA spot is hyperpigmented, as you can see there. Half ALA spots, axillary freckling, fibroma, eye leash nodules, skeletal abnormalities. Uh, positive history and optical tumors or optic nerve gliomas, guys, for, for that. And if we contrast this to neurofibromatosis 2, think 22, twos, right? Just think of all the twos that have two. Chromosome 22, two ears. It causes that bilateral schwannoma, which we were, were talking about with cranial nerve 8, right? Remember cranial nerve 8, vestibulocochlear. Symptoms of tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo. And finally, guys, just bringing in the CT image of what you're expecting to see, um, which is this bilateral schwannoma, right? You can remember the S100, cerebellopontine angle, and then you have problems with your cranial nerves 8 and 7, hearing and winking. This is how I remember it. Super, super helpful. All right. We are on our last section. Um, so this, was, this has been an amazing session. I'm so glad um, so many of you have, uh, have been participating. I hope this has been helpful. but we're going to end off with some ophthalmology and some receptor integration. 
So we have a 67 year old female presents to the emergency department with sudden onset redness and pain in her left eye. She complains of blurred vision in the left eye and it started when she was watching a movie. Physical exam, she has a mid dilated, irregular, unresponsive pupil that is firm on palpation. When given drops of helocarpine, among other medications, what is the following mechanism of action of helocarpine in treating this patient's glaucoma? I see some answers in the chat. I see some C's. And if you are saying C, you are absolutely correct. And this is where we're going to tie something really important in. And that is, let's look, take a look at the eye. Okay. So we know that in our eye, there's two main pathways that our aqueous humor can be drained out of. It can be drained through our trabecular meshwork, right? Through the channel of Schlem, which is predominantly where most of the aqueous humor is drained. But it can also be drained through our uveal scleral outflow tracts, which is through the uvea and sclera. Okay. This is a little image here of the eye. A reminder that in glaucoma, you get narrowing of this retocorneal angle, right? You get increased intraocular pressure, you get, um, and you get those findings that we saw um, in the patient with the blurred eye um, in mid-dilated, irregular, unresponsive pupil, okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to integrate really important pharmacology. If we think about aqueous humor in the eye, there's two ways to decrease it. We can either decrease the production via the ciliary bodies, or we can increase the amount that's outflowed as we see here through the trabecular outflow or uveoscleral tract. Really easy mnemonic to remember the decreasing inflow is your ABCs. Your alpha-2 agonists like um, bromonidine, your beta blockers like timolol, and your carbonic anhydrous inhibitors like acetazolamide. Very, very important, guys, that we understand acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that decreases production of aqueous humor from the ciliary bodies. Okay, And that was answer one there, as you can see there. Now, there's, oh, there's a second way that we can do that, and that's through increasing our outflow tracts, okay? If we increase via the channel of Schlem, which is our trabecular outflow tract, this is through agonists of our M3 pathway, our M3 receptor, such as carbocol or pilocarpi, okay? That was the correct answer in the case of our question. Contraction of the sphincter pupillae, okay, causing meiosis, constriction, is going to increase the amount that we can actually um, outflow or aqueous humor uh, drainage. And then prostaglandins are going to be the ones that actually um, cause increased uveoscleral outflow. And remember thing, uh, remember the common agent latanoprost for that one, okay? So just understanding, we can decrease aqueous humor production by two ways. We can decrease inflow through our ABCs. We can increase outflow through our channel um, via M3 agonists or via uveoscleral tract via prostaglandins like latanoprost. Everyone good with that? Let's finally do a receptor integration, highly tested on the US assembly. Here's a little trick from my endocrine guide that just came out, um, just remembering the uh, GQ versus GI versus GS, which is important. But if we turn our head to alpha, remember alpha one is going to cause smooth muscle contraction, okay? That's gonna cause our blood vessels to contract, our pylorus to contract, our urinary sphincters contract. And actually think about what our, uh, SNS does. Our SNS causes contraction to dilate our pupil, right? Fight or flight. When you see a bear, eyes get wide. CNS, you're going to dilate pupil. You're going to constrict your blood vessels. You want to have a rush of blood to the vital organs. You don't want to pee. You don't want to digest, right? So think of that as your, um, your uh, SNS, right? Alpha 2 is going to be the opposite. That's going to inhibit outflow of your, uh, of your SNS. And then finally, guys, with our beta receptors, remember beta 1, one heart is going to be cardioselective. Beta 2, two lungs is going to affect your lungs and uh, your blood vessels, right, causing vasodilation. And then your beta 3, remember, um, integration with urination um, as it decreases urination. Again, there's a little trick here just to remember. Um, kiss, 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 kiss. If you just remember QISS, QISS, QS, QS, and you just write it in this order, alpha, B's, M, D, H, V. So it just goes one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, right? And that's going to be your integration there. So that wraps up the session. Um, thank you guys for all participating. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm excited to run more of these for you all, um, covering all the other disciplines and, and hope this was helpful. Um, what we're gonna do is we're going to have an opportunity for you guys to have any questions. Um, we're going to also do a giveaway in our in our Discord. And so just a reminder, everyone, that this is a unique QR code that will give you 50% off 
lifetime membership access to our Discord at $4.99 a month. Um, we host webinars like this on a weekly basis. We have um, tons of other students, pre-meds and med students, um, collaborating in the community. Uh, we have questions of the days, we have office hours, we have exclusive PDF resources, we have channels for everything, whether it be interview prep, applications, interviews, um, etc. And just a reminder that also in the Discord community, you have access to an exclusive discount code for all my products. You get a discount code of up to 20% off um, if you join the community of all my products. Fahad and Khaled, I'm not sure if you guys wanted to say anything. Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, thank you so much for that, Jake. Uh, as Jake mentioned, there's a ton of features in Discord. Fahad and I are also uh, in the Discord on a daily basis. Should you have any questions about uh, medical school in general, clinical rotations? Uh, this was really focused on step one, and a lot of this material overlaps on step two, but uh, we also have targeted uh, webinars on step two. And then finally, uh, any questions about applying to residency as well? Yeah. Awesome, guys. So we will be doing a giveaway of our my neurology guide, which is where a lot of these concepts and all those images you saw were. Uh, we're going to be doing that in the Discord community um, after this. So be sure to join. Um, again, uh, it's the same as, as a coffee uh, that you get on any day. And there's tons and tons of amazing opportunities for you guys to um, interact with us, interact with the community, and join a lot of these events, attend these events like you did today. Um, just looking at the chat, does anyone have any other questions? I know brown saccard syndrome is a little bit of a trickier uh, pathophys to get your head around, so we can do a detailed explanation in our Discord uh, as well. Um, I wanted to just make sure that that was all clear for everyone. Any other questions about the Discord community or about step one, neurology? Not for now. Well then, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Looking forward to running more of these sessions um, covering all the other disciplines for step one. Um, and uh, Fahad and Khaled will continue to run um, webinars for step two and for application interview prep as well. Thank you for attending. Yep. Thanks, everyone.